Hello, my name is Hokon, and welcome back, all you fabulous fighting fantasy aficionados, other viewers, friends, family, and just random passes by. Today, I'm going to, in my series of uh, playing fighting fantasy adventure game books, the time has come for this fighting fantasy number three. I'm doing them in order now, after a few random ones, uh, and doing number ones and numbers one and two. Uh, I'm doing number three, which is Ian Livingstone's The Forest of Doom. Unlike uh, the previous one, The Citadel of um, Chaos, this one I have done before. I can sort of vaguely remember possibly winning it. I don't think it's a very difficult book to sort of figure out. It's um, quite simplistic, I think, uh, after number two, but... Um, I'm going to do them all and I'll uh, keep a slightly open mind because my impression of these books um, is a bit different now um, after playing them again so many years later. I mean, if you if you add 30 years to your life, then your perspective is sometimes a bit different and your tastes might be different. Um, your sense of enjoyment might feel be a little different. And um, I think generally I actually enjoy them more this time. Uh, around. So, uh, this one I've actually also played uh, one of the computerized versions, did not like it at all. I think something goes missing when you convert it from a book to a computer game, but um, that's just me, I guess. Uh, the thing is, if you're playing a basically, if you if the computerized versions of these are just the book on the computer, so it's like reading a book on the screen kind of feel to it and um, and of course it does sort out the dice rolls and the character sheet but it's not quite the same is it I mean leafing through a leafing through a book it's uh, it's got its own charm and, um, and of course the way the game is structured is based around the possibilities and limitations of the format of the book as well if you wanted to start making it a computer game then you can do it differently and in better ways right so I'm gonna play the Forest of Doom. So I'll be uh, ready. Uh, the reason the camera angle is a bit strange today is because I'm not going to move around my cameras after the introduction. I'm leaving them as they are. Uh, I've set up my camera for the uh, overhead shot and I've got this camera for uh, the shot of me. And um, hopefully I'll remember today that this is where the camera is. So I'm every now and again going to have a look uh, to, to catch your eye as it were. And... Um, when I play The Forest of Doom. I'll be ready in a moment. Let's see, so here we are. Um, I've already got some of my things I out here. I've got my, um, my book, as you can see, got my pens, pencil, my dice. Um, I was thinking um, when I started playing this, I had these bigger ones, but the problem with them is being bigger, they also need a little bit more area to roll on. Doesn't always work so well. Uh, in this format, these are quite good. They're quite easy to see as well. Um, so I'm going to keep to do using those. I got uh, paper for my character sheet, paper for my map, uh, and the book, and also, of course, a cup of tea. Mm. Lovely. Okay, my first cup of the day. So um, I finished another video this morning, and then I'm. Had my cup of tea after as a, as a reward to myself, I guess, for finishing it. Um, how's my angle? I think I need to angle it up a little bit more. How is that? So I don't cut off my the top of my head too much. And also just down a little bit so we don't see too much of the overhead camera there. Right. So. Uh, character sheet first of all. That one doesn't go there. So, I um, think we are back to basics here. Let's see, and this being book number two, it says they first published 1983, uh, reprinted 1983 11 times and 1984 five times. Well, and at this time, it still didn't say how many had been sold, but the numbers were getting quite big already. Um, illustrations in this one are by Malcolm Barter, they're also quite nice. 
And the cover illustration was, and oh no, so I'm supposed to know this, that's, um, I got a mind blank now. It's, um, is that Michael Bartra as well? Well, it might be. Anyway, I thought it was someone else there. Anyway, right, let's see. So we've got skill, stamina, and luck back to basics after the magic system of fighting fantasy book number two. Skill, stamina, luck. And I'll roll for those today. Uh, starting with a skill. So that's uh, eight stamina. 23. I'll need that with a skill of eight. And luck. A very mediocre nine. Let's see how I get around with those. And uh, let's see. Battles. Escaping. Fighting more than one creature. Using luck in battles. All the usual stuff. It says that you have provisions in this one as well. Which means that you can eat. And you get four points of stamina back. And it says you may rest and eat at any time except when engaged in battle. As you may remember in Fighting Fantasy number one, the Warlock of Fighter Mountain, you were actually told specifically when you could rest and eat, which I thought was a nice touch, really. Um, okay. Uh, let's see, you may also take a potion, it says here. And they got one measure in the potion, so I suppose as potion of stamina is usually the one I go for. Technically it's called potion of strength, but I think that's a bit sort of misleading. So I call it the potion of stamina, and I got one measure of that. And then I have Ooh. A sip of tea, also a kind of potion of stamina. Right, remember to do the hints on play, because it's slightly different from each book. And there is one true way through Darkwood Forest, and it will take you several attempts to find it, it says here. Make notes and draw a map as you explore. This map will be invaluable in future adventures and enable you to progress rapidly through to unexplored sections. Not all areas contain treasure. Many merely contain traps and creatures. Well, why are you looking for treasure? Is this Ian Livingstone thing? He's so obsessed with treasure. Not all areas contain treasure. Many merely contain traps and creatures which you will no doubt fall foul of. There are many wild goose chase passages, and while you may indeed progress through to your ultimate destination, it is by no means certain that you will find what you are searching for. It will be realized that entries make no sense if read in numerical order, blah blah blah. Um, yeah, that's not interesting. The one true way involves a minimum of risk, and any player, no matter how weak on initial dice rolls, should be able to get through fairly easily. Uh, that's one that's been sort of copied and pasted into other books where that is not true, but that's another story. May the luck of the gods go with you on the adventure ahead. And may your stamina never fail, etc. So, um, I'll have another sip of tea before I start on what in this one is called background. I think in, in the first one it was called Rumours. In the second one, it was called History. Am I right? Uh, yes, I think it was called History. And... Yes, History, and in this one, it is called Background, which I presume might be the standardized way of doing it in other books, but uh, don't quote me on that just yet, because I haven't got to that through that many books yet. Oh, let's see, how is my focus on the main camera? Okay, that looks okay, I think. So, uh, yeah, I'm just do it a little bit lower down. Like so, yeah, let's leave it there. You are an adventurer, a sword for hire, and have been roaming the northern borderlands of your kingdom. Having always spurned the dullness of village life, you now wander the lands in search of wealth and danger. 
Despite the long walks and rough outdoor life, you are content with your unknown destiny. The world holds no fears for you as you are a skillful warrior, well practiced in the art of slaying evil men and beasts with your trusty sword. Not once during the last ten days since entering the northern borderlands have you set eyes upon another person. This does not worry you at all as you are happy with your own company and enjoy the slow sunny days hunting, eating and sleeping. It is evening and having feasted on a dinner of rabbit spit roasted on an open fire, you settle down to sleep beneath your sheepskin blanket. There's a full moon and the light sparkles on the blade of your broadsword, skewered into the ground by your side. Why would you skewer your broadsword into the ground by your side? I know it looks cool in paintings, but I mean seriously, you open it. I mean, you put it in the ground, it'll it'll rust. You gaze at it, wondering when you will next have to wipe the blood of some vile creature from its sharp edge. Also, it dulls the edge. These are strange lands, inhabited by weird and loathsome beasts, goblins, trolls, and even dragons. As the flame of your campfire gently dies, you begin to drift asleep, and images of screaming, green-faced trolls flicker through your mind. Suddenly, in the bushes to your left, you hear the loud crack of a twig breaking under a clumsy foot. You leap up and grab your sword from the ground. You stand motionless but alert, ready to pounce on your unseen adversary. Then you hear a groan, followed by the dull thud of a body falling to the ground. Is it the trap? Slowly you walk over to the bush where the noise is coming from and carefully pull back the branches. You look down to see a little old man with a great bushy beard, his face contorted with pain. You crouch down to remove the iron helmet covering his balding head and notice two crossbow bolts protruding from his from the stomach of his plump chainmail clad torso. Picking him up, you carry him over to the fire and stir the dying embers into life. After covering him with a sheepskin blanket, you manage to get the old man to drink a little water. He coughs and moans. He sits up rigid, eyes staring fixedly ahead, and starts to shout. I'll get them, I'll get them. Don't you fear, Gillibrand. Big Leg is coming to bring you the hammer. Oh yes, indeed I am. Oh yes. The dwarf, whose name you presume it to be Big Leg, is obviously delirious from the poison-tipped bolts lodged in his stomach. You watch as he watches his slumps down again to the ground, then whisper his name in his ear. His eyes stare unblinkingly at you as he again starts to shout. Ambush! Look out! Ambush! Ah! Oh, the hammer! Take the hammer to Gillibrand! Save the dwarfs! His eyes are half close, and the pain seems to ease a little, and as the delirium subsides, he speaks to you again in a low whisper. Help us, friend. Take the hammer to Gillibran. Only the hammer will unite our people against the trolls. We were on our way to Darkwood in search of the hammer, ambushed by the little people, others killed. The map in my pouch will take you to the home of Yastromo, the master mage of these parts. He has great magics for sale to protect you against the creatures of Darkwood. Take my gold. I beg you to find the hammer and take it to Gillibran, my lord of Stonebridge. You will be well rewarded. Big Leg opens his mouth to start another sentence, but nothing comes out except his last dying breath. You sit down and ponder Big Leg's words. Who is Gillibran? Who is Yastromo? Mm, who, who is all the fuss about the dwarf? What is all the fuss about the dwarfish hammer? You reach over to the still body of Big Leg and remove the pouch from the leather belt around his waist. Inside you find 30 gold pieces and a map. And the map, as you can see, is extremely useful. There's Tromos Tower, Stonebridge, River, Road, Darkwood Forest. Yeah, not very useful at all. Anyway. Um... And also it's a bit strange that this adventurer who travels around far and wide doesn't know Stonebridge and Gillibran and Yastromo already, but that's another story. Um, so 30 gold pieces and a map, and there we are. Jingling the coins in your hand, you think of the possible rewards which may await you just for returning a hammer to a village of dwarfs. You decide to try to find the hammer in Darkwood Forest. It's been a few weeks since your last good battle, and what is more, you are likely to be well paid for this one. So again, obsessed with the money. Um, Typical Ian Livingstone book. With your mind made up, the settle, you settle down to sleep, having taken back the sheepskin blanket from poor Big Leg. 
In the morning you bury the old dwarf and gather up your possessions. You examine the map, looking up to the sun, and find your bearings. Whistling merrily, you head off south at a good pace, eager to meet this man Yaz Tromo and see what he has to offer. Now turn over. Right. So... Uh, let's see, do this. Right. Number one, paragraph number one. So here we are. Your walk to Yaz Tromo's takes a little over half a day, and you arrive at his stone tower home, dirty and hungry. As the tower is set back on the edges of Darkwood, some fifty meters away from the path you have been following, it is difficult to find. Finally, you walk up to the huge oak door, somewhat relieved to find that it does exist and that Big Leg had not been speaking wildly in his delirium. A large brass bell and gong hang from the stone archway. As you ring the bell, a shiver runs down your spine and you realise that the loud bong invades a deep silence, which you had not noticed before. There are no sounds of birds or animals to be heard. You wait anxiously at the door and hear slow footsteps descending stairs from the tower above. A small wooden slot in the door slides open, and two eyes appear and examine you. Well, who are you? demands a grumpy voice through the hall. You answer that you are an adventurer in search of the master mage Yaz Tromo, intending to purchase magical items from him to combat the creatures of Darkwood Forest. Oh, well, in that case, if you're interested in buying some of my merchandise, you'd better come up. I am Yaz Tromo. He then turns and slowly climbs the stone stairs. Will you follow him up the stairs or draw your sword and attack him? Uh, now, I think if you attack him, that's the end of the story right there. And I think it's a bit bizarre almost to put in that as an option. But there you go. It is an option. Um, at almost every turn, it seems to... Um, Let's see, I should start doing my mapping, actually. Um, I think this one is a bit... The way it is... I'm just going to do the map from scratch when I've finished winning, probably. I might just do a sort of a geographical map now, because the way it's structured is more geographical in this one. So, um, And your choices are more to do with where you go rather than what you do. But... Um, so I'm not going to make any notes just yet. I'm going to follow him up the stairs. I'm just going to do Yastromo's so Yaz, I call it Yaz's Yaz's tower down there. Uh, follow him up the stairs, 261. Oh, that's a long, long one now. You follow the huffing and puffing old man in his tattered robes up the spiral staircase to a large room at the top of the tower. Shelves, cupboards, and cabinets line the walls, all filled with bottles, jars, weapons, armor, and all manner of strange artifacts. The Astromo shuffles past the general clutter and slumps down in an old oak chair. He reaches into his top pocket and pulls out a fragile pair of gold-rimmed spectacles. Placing these on his nose, he picks up a piece of slate and chalk from a table next to his chair and begins to write frantically. He then hands you the slate. So these are the items I can purchase. Um, uh, right, so we've got Potion of Healing, Potion of Plant Control, Stillness, Insect Control, Anti-Poison, Holy Water, Ring of Light, Boots of Leaping, Rope of Climbing, Net of Entanglement, Armband of Strength, Glove of Missile Dexterity, Rod of Water Finding, Garlic Buds, Headband of Concentration, Fire capsules and nose filters. Now, I know a lot of these are needed. I'm sure maybe all of them are needed actually at some point um, in the game. You have 30 gold, so you can buy about 10, 12 things. Um, let's see how many things are there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 things. Let's see, they all together they cost. Um, Let's see, 5, 10, 15, 20, 29, 35, 
44, which only means I need those 14 gold pieces worth of stuff that I can't buy. Um, right, so what should I not take then? Hmm. Insect control, anti poison. Still, stillness sounds a bit boring. Healing sounds a bit boring. Hmm. Armband of band of strength. I don't know. What the garlic buds sound a bit boring as well. Let's see, so I'll take um, plant control. I'll just write down the price so I can see if that adds up to 30. Insect control. Um, Anti-poison sounds useful. Holy water. Ring of light. I'm not sure about the holy water though. Mm, anyway. Uh, Woods of leaping. Rope of climbing. Net of entanglements. I'll skip that. Well, net, okay, I'll do net of entanglement. Uh, let's see. Entanglement. Three. Water finding. Rod. Water. Fire capsules. Sounds like fun. Sounds like fireworks. Nose filters. Okay, so how much is that now? That's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, seventeen, twenty, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight. I've got enough for another two gold one. Let's just do garlic buds. And so that's my thirty gold spent. Okay. Right, he tells you that all the instructions for use are written clearly on the labels attached to the items, together with their suggested use. He sighs and tells you that, unfortunately, the magic in the items only works once, but they are the best you can buy for the money. If you decide to buy any of these items, pay for them by reducing the amount of gold in their adventure sheet. Mm and add the items to the relevant sections on it. Yastroma then asks you the reason for the purchase of the items, and you tell him your story and your decision to continue the quest of the luckless big leg. Ah, yes, Yastroma says slowly, rubbing his chin. Um, yes. I heard that the good dwarves of Stonebridge had lost their fabled warhammer. Without it, the king is unable to arouse his people, despite the fact that the hill trolls threaten their village. Rumour has it that an envious king of another village of dwarves sent an eagle to Stonebridge to steal the hammer, which it managed to do. But as it flew back over Darkwood, it was attacked by death hawks, and the hammer dropped into the forest and was lost. Apparently, two forest goblins found the hammer, but could not decide who was to keep it. They wrestled for hours but gave up, then they discovered that the handle unscrewed from the head and the argument was settled. One kept the head, the other kept the handle. And then they parted, each happy with, an, with his new treasure. Who knows if they still have them. So I'm afraid your problems are doubled. I can tell you that the head is made of bronze and the handle is made of polished ebony. Both head and handle have a letter G inscribed on them. Your task is not easy. Good luck. You thank you, Astromo, and leave the room by the spiral staircase. Turn to 170. 
seven. Outside in the bright light, you notice the dead quietness again. A narrow path leads northwards from the tall grass surrounding Yastromo's tower into the dense undergrowth of darkwood forest. In a few strides, you are surrounded by the dark and tangled forest. Stoned and knotted roots seem to hide in the shadows, and you can almost believe that they are trying to trip you up. The light fades quickly and the air becomes moist and unpleasant. Deeper and deeper you go into the gloom. Eventually the path forks on either side of a huge old tree. So we have our first branching path. So we have the west. Let's just do or east. So 289 west, 160 east. And I shall start by going west. Even though I have played this before, I have no idea where to go now. So The narrow overgrown path continues to weave its way through the crowded forest. Strange animal cries echo through the trees. It's not long before you arrive at another junction in the path. Which to continue westwards, turn to, excuse me, 76. If you wish to turn north, turn to 147. Let's go west again. I hear life is peaceful there. I'm not sure that is true in this case, but there you go. The path turns suddenly to the right and proceeds northwards into the dense undergrowth. Turn to 206, so it's turning around like so. And 206. Suddenly off the path to your left you hear cries for help. If you wish to go to the aid of the person in trouble, turn to 253. If you'd rather ignore the cries and continue your journey north, turn to 187. So we've got 187 or 253. So I'm going to uh, investigate this little thing here, of course. 253, cries for help. Clambering over the gnarled roots of the old trees, you head in the direction of the cries. After a few minutes, you see a man dressed in long, dark robes with his foot caught in a rusted rabbit snare. His face is masked by the robes and only his dark brown eyes are visible. If you want to help the man free his foot from the snare, turn to 344. If you decide against helping him, return to the path and head north, then turn to 187. So I'll three forty four help. So I'll help him see what happens. It does feel like a trap for some reason. You wedge your sword between the jaws of the snare and pull on it like a lever. The robed stranger adds his strength and finally the snare springs open. He thanks you over and over again and explains that he is in the forest looking for his long-lost brother, who he thinks is living the life of a hermit somewhere in its depths. Together you scramble back over the roots of the trees to the path. You ask him to accompany you north, but he politely declines, saying that he believes his brother lives to the south. You shake hands and bid each other farewell. Turn to 36. Okay. Thinking about the robed stranger, you feel a little uncomfortable. There was something about his manner that you did not trust. You stop to take a look in your backpack and are annoyed to find something is missing. The man was a thief. Deduct either all your remaining gold pieces or two of the magic... Oh, come on. Two of the magic items you may have purchased from Yastromo from your adventure sheet. You're in two minds about whether 
or not to run after the thief, but you sense that he will not be where he said he was going. You curse and start off north again, turn to 187. So, okay, so he is a thief, and you do not want to go there, and I have to remove two items. So I will remove um, my garlic buds and my holy water. Yeah, bit random there. Um, right. So, hundred and eighty. Seven. So we have walking along the twisting path. You see a small, sinewy creature with brown, scaly skin sitting on a log on the right of the path. He has a sullen expression on his face, and he slowly tosses the black, shiny rod on a leather cord back and forth between his hands. You might go one of the goblins you're looking for. Do you draw your sword and attack the goblin? Try to start a conversation with the goblin? Or ignore him and continue walking north? So... We have... A few options here. Yeah. So, um, six is going north. Um, attack is 286, attack, talk is uh, 203. I'm going to start talking to him, see if there's any sense in doing that sort of thing. He's still given the option. Ah, uh, yeah, I, th I thought this might be the case. Um, it reminded me of picture so it's a, a shape changer as you start to speak the goblin looks up and smiles and he starts to metamorphose before your eyes he becomes taller and turns green a large spiny tail extends from his back his arms thicken and his hands grow sharp claws his face distorts and becomes reptilian with red eyes a wide mouth and dozens of razor sharp teeth he's not a goblin but a shape changer and you must fight him. So this is this charming fellow right here. Um, right, so skill 10, stamina 10. This could go very badly. So um, I am 823, but I do have a potion of stamina and uh, he is 10, 10. I should do 10, 10 first actually, because he rolls first. Uh, let's see, yes, I can see the dice rolls here. So uh, he rolled a 5, I rolled a 2, I'm down to 21 stamina. Um, yeah, maybe I should just, as I always do, just uh, say something about the combat system. Um, you have a skill and a stamina, and your opponent has a skill and a stamina. Skill means how good you are at actually fighting, um, in this case, uh, and stamina how much you can endure of injuries. So, um, in combat, your enemy, the one you're fighting, rolls the two dice first, and you add those, those that number you get from rolling two dice to his skill score. That's his attack score. You do the same for yourself. Um, so, in this case, he rolled, I can't remember what it was now, but um, uh, let's just say it was six. And he's got a skill of 10, so his attack score is 16. I rolled a 2 and I have a skill of 8, so my attack score is 10. His was higher, which means I get injured for 2 points. If mine was higher, he would have got injured for 2 points. And if it was equal, nobody would, would have got injured at all, because then you just parry each other's attacks. Um, that's basic fighting fantasy game book combat. Um, I'll just roll again now, because I lost my train of thought there. So, okay, so he rolls a six, I roll an eight, so that is equal because six plus ten is sixteen, eight plus eight is sixteen, so equal numbers, nobody gets injured that combat round. Uh, he rolls an eight, I roll five, he rolls a five, I roll a five, that's me getting injured again. 
You roll to three, I roll a six. So that is me finally getting some damage in. He rolls a seven, I roll a seven. Basically now his skill is too high than mine, so I need to roll three higher than his roll to, to injure him. He rolls a ten, so that that's, wouldn't really work well, does it? Let's see. He rolls a nine, I roll a six. He rolls a nine, I roll a four. He rolls a six, I roll a six. He rolls a two, I roll a five. He rolls an eleven, I roll an eight. Um, he rolls a three, I roll a nine. He rolls a six, I roll a ten. Okay, so he's down to two hit points now. I usually like calling it hit points rather than stamina because uh, that's what I'm used to from Dungeons and Dragons and many other role-playing games. He rolls 10, I roll 12, that's a draw. He rolls a 4 and I roll 12, so that is... he is dead. I've got 5 stamina left, um, but I won the battle. Um, so this is, uh, let's see, 203, 10, 10, 15, 10, shape changer. I'm quite sure this can't surely be the optimum path to go because that seems a little bit difficult. Right, so I won that battle, I got to 373. Um, I think we've done a little bit like so. Yeah, there we go. Uh, you slump onto the log exhausted after your long battle. That was a really long battle, so that's true. Sadly, the black rod was just part of the shape changer's illusion and it exists no more. However, you notice some violet mushrooms growing behind the log. They are unfamiliar to you, but look tasty. You wish to eat some of the mushrooms, turn to 308. If you would rather continue north, turn to 148. So. 148 north, or eat purple mushrooms. Well, if in doubt, it's always purple mushrooms, isn't it? Um, I'm going to eat some purple mushrooms. On eating some of the mushrooms, you feel a great turmoil inside your body. You think you might be turning into a shape changer. At last you are relieved to feel the turmoil dying down and you have not become a shape changer, but you have eaten mix-up mushrooms. Your skill score now becomes your luck score and your luck score becomes your skill score. That is a bit weird. Okay. So, um, swap, luck and skill. So my luck is now eight, my, no, luck is eight, my skill is nine right now that that's some seriously weird weird mushrooms feeling a little odd you set off north again turn to 148 right is my um yeah my map is inside the shot yeah good i'm setting a little bit of skew now uh, I do like setting a skew at my desk, I don't know why. The path continues north and you soon reach another junction. If you wish to continue north, turn to 97. If you wish to go east, turn to 20. Um, I don't know how this connects with the 6 north here, but uh, let's go back here, really. Um, oh, excuse me, got a text message. I'll just check if it's something important. Uh, not really. Okay. Uh, right.
right. Where was I? Yes. Um, ba -ba -bum. Going north is 97. Or east. I'll just do that over there, just in case. Is 20. Oh, north. I'm just going to continue north, I think. The path leads ever northwards, but at last the trees are beginning to thin out and appear less menacing as daylight streams through between them. On the right-hand side of the path you see an old oak chair covered with moss. If you wish to sit in the chair to rest and eat, turn to 328. If you would rather press on northwards, turn to 118. So we've got uh, 328 rest and actually I should be doing that anyway or 118 continue north I'm going to sit down and rest um really should have done that before but now um, at this point I will just do that so um despite being made of hard oak the chair is surprisingly comfortable you start to eat, but instead of feeling stronger, you feel weaker. You are sitting in a chair of life draining, which drains four points from your stamina score, despite eating a portion of your provisions. Uh, okay, that's quite nasty. So I'm down to nine, and my stamina is down to one, because it was five after the battle. If you're still alive, you manage to climb slowly out of the chair and stagger northwards along the path. Turn to 118. So I suppose I go to 118 before I can eat properly then. Um, okay, it's 118. The path eventually emerges from the trees onto a vast plain. Beyond, you see rising ground leading to low hills. The waist high grasses on either side of the path sway gently in the warm breeze. All is peaceful, and the dangers ahead seem unimportant. You are enjoying your walk, and suddenly the silence is broken by the sound of squealing and grunting to the right of the path. You can see a path being made through the grass by an unseen beast moving quickly towards you. You draw your sword in readiness. A few yards ahead of you, a large brown pig-like creature bursts out onto the path and halts there. It has two long tusks protruding from a short, stubby snout. Steam rises into the air from its sweating body. Its small eyes look at you before it puts its head down to charge at you. You must fight the wild boar. That's wild boar skill six stamina five. I've got one hit point left though, so before I fight it, I will have to use my potion of stamina. That brings my stamina up to 23 again. Um, a potion can be used any time of the game according to uh, the rules. Um, provisions only when you're not fighting, but potions also in the fight. So um, I can do that. So I'm going to fight this 6-5 and of course my fighting is better now after my encounter with the mushrooms. Um, so 6-5 and my skill stamina is 9-23. So uh, let's, I'll just sit up properly again. Uh, so the boar rolls first, he rolls 6 and I roll 5 so that means I hit him. He rolls a seven, I roll a seven. He's got one hit point left. He rolls a five and I roll a seven, so the boar is dead. If you win, turn to 174. So let's see, 118, that is a boar. Six, five, 90 says the rest. That was a cursed, it's a cursed, that's a must see, stamina. Minus four. So, um, 174 for winning. As you draw your sword from the carcass of the wild boar, you wonder what made it attack you. In the distance, you hear the sound of barking dogs. Perhaps it was being hunted and being trapped made its last stand against you. Um, through the nose of the boar, you see a large gold ring, which you cut loose and place in your backpack. This were 10 gold pieces. So I've got a, a ring worth 10. 
Add one luck point. Can't do that because my luck is at the maximum. Um, so uh, let's see, 173, I'll just... 173 gold ring luck plus one. So that's, there we are. Uh, 23, 23, so that is continuing presumably along the path. So let's see what happens next. Walking north, you soon arrive at a junction in the path. You may continue north. So that's north, uh, west, or east. Uh, east is 102, west is 99, or north is 291. I've sort of done the western route now, so I may as well continue doing that. And I'm going to go to 99. Ahead you see that the path ends at the door of a large hut made of dried mud. It has a domed roof and a single window. You peer through the window and see a large man with dark skin sitting at a table in the middle of the hut. He is bare-chested and is flexing the muscles of his arms. You wish to enter the hut, turn to 209, but rather return to the junction in the path, turn to 349. So we've got... 349. Return. Or uh, 209, enter. So I'm going to enter and have a little look and see what's going on here. As you enter the hut, the big man smiles. He looks pleased to see you and starts to speak in a deep voice. Welcome, stranger. My name is Quinn and I earn my living by my arms. Would you care for a little wager, perhaps, at arm wrestling? wish to accept the challenge, turn to 28. If you wish to decline his offer, you politely refuse and return to the junction in the path. So. Twenty-eight arm um, wrestle. Uh, I'm going to just check out the arm wrestling thing. I don't think I'll be very good at it, but. If you possess an armband of strength, to fit. Okay, ah, so that's where that comes in. So we've got um, uh, uh, so that is doo -doo -doo -doo. so 52 armband of strength. I didn't take the armband of strength. No, I didn't take the armband of strength. Armband of strength or no armband. So that's the other one is 266. Oh, not 26. 266. There we are. So this might, might actually be the only place where you need the armband of strength because most of these items you only need them one place. Uh, Quinn explains. It looks a bit Chinese, or maybe it's twin. Tu Chuin. Explains that he will wager some dust of levitation against an item or coins to the value of 10 gold pieces. So I can wager the ring that I just found. You sit down at the table opposite him. You put your elbow onto the table and lock hands with him. Um, his grip is like an iron vice and his dark slanted eyes look confident. His biceps bulge and he gives a signal for the contest to begin. Roll two dice. The number all is less than or equal to your skill score. You manage with great effort to push his arm down slightly. So, um, test skill. Your stronger will not give in easily. You must roll successfully against your skill score two more times before you're able to push his arm down onto the tabletop. If you are successful, turn to 354. If any of the three rolls exceeds your skill score, your arm gives way to twins strength and collapses onto the tabletop. So okay, I need to do test skill times three. Um, and let's see, so that is um, one, two, nine, lose. And three, five, four, three, five, four, win. Okay, 
So I need to do three scale tests, and so I need to roll below nine three times in a row, which I did earlier, but yeah, let's see if I can do that again. Uh, that's one time. Uh, nine or below, actually. Uh, yes, less than or equal, so nine or below. That's two times, and one more time. Four, yeah, so I've actually managed to do it. So um, and going to 354. Quinn, Quinn, Chuin shakes his head in disbelief. He stands up and walks silently to a wooden chest at the back of the hut. He lifts the lid and pulls out a small glass vial. He hands it to you and walks back to the table where he slumps in his chair, looking thoroughly dejected. The dust in the vial sparkles in the light and you put it into your backpack and leave the hut. So that was dust of levitation. So let's see, dust of Levitation. That's what it was called, wasn't it? Right, so. Um, back to the junction, turn to 349. So that is 349 there. You arrive back at the crossroads, ignoring the way south back to the forest. You may go north, turn to 291, so that is uh, there, yeah, or continue east, 102, so I am, um, basically 349 is the same as 323 in terms of directions, so I'm going like so, so 349, 102, there we are. So I'm going to go north, and going to 291. As you walk further northwards across the plain, the grass gradually becomes shorter and the ground starts to rise gently. Ahead you hear the roar of crashing water. Soon you reach the bank of a wide river split on two levels. To your right, the water is calm and slow-moving, but in front of you it tumbles noisily down the great waterfall to a gorge below, where the river narrows and runs quickly west over rocks and boulders. Steps lead down by the side of the waterfall to the bottom of the gorge, although it is difficult to see where they end because of the spray thrown up. Across the river you see the path heading north into the distance. A small wooden boat is tied to a post to your right, where the river is calm. Will you walk down the steps to the base of the waterfall or row the wooden boat across the river? Interesting choice, interesting choice. Uh, let's see, uh, so we're doing like that, I guess. So we've got three, three, five, walk, or one, four, five, row. Now, I suppose if you row, you suddenly realize that there's a lot of current, which there should be, even though it looks calm. Um, and you have to really struggle to avoid going over the waterfall. So if you go down, then there might be other perils. I'm going to do walk down the steps though, to the base of the waterfall and see what there is there. I can't actually remember anything of this bit now. I knew, I knew there was a river, obviously, but I can't remember any of how this worked. Now you walk down the slippery stone steps to the bottom of the waterfall. You look up and see a magnificent rainbow reflected in the spray. It is dark in the gorge and impossible to see through the wall of water where the steps end. If you wish to walk through the sheet of water, turn to 181. If you wish to climb back up, turn to 326. So we've got... one eighty-one. Or, so, walk through, or walk back, 326, 326, like return, I call it. Um, obviously, I want to walk through the sheet of water and have a look at what's behind, because I'm curious. And even though curious to kill the cat, maybe it won't kill me, I'm not a cat. You walk along the steps through the waterfall into a large cavern where there is a pool of still water. And you've got this charming uh, creature here as well. Um, 
The steps run round the side of the pool and there is a stone table and chair on the far side. I go to the table and see fish scraps lying on it. Suddenly you hear a noise of splashing behind you. A strange creature climbs out of the pool and advances towards you armed with a trident. Its legs are like a man's, but his face and torso resemble a large green fish with bulbous eyes. His arms are like yours, but are covered with large scales. He is a fishman, and you must fight him. So, for those of you who played World of Warcraft, he's a bit like a, it's a murloc, isn't he? Right, fishman. If you win, turn 262. So we've got um, fishman. Uh, seven six. So let's see. Fish man seven six. So, yeah. uh, okay. Um, seven six. My I'm nine twenty three at the moment. So that is good. Um, and let's see. This rolling is in the middle of this picture now. That is good as well. Uh, so he's got a seven and he rolls a seven. I roll a seven. So that is my hit. He rolls a nine, I roll a six, that means I lost two hit points. He rolls three and I rolled five, so he's down to two hit points. He rolls three, very good, and I roll three, and that is the end of him. My stamina is down to 21, and he is dead. And I win, and I've turned 162. Okay. Sixty-two. Win. There is nothing of use or value in the fishman's cave, so you walk round to the north side wall. Steps lead back through the waterfall and up the north wall of the gorge to the top. You are at the foot of some hills and can see the path climbing up into the midst in the north. It is getting dark and night is closing in, so you decide to camp behind some rocks to the right of the path. You build a large fire and settle down to sleep with your sword by your side. Turn to 285. So, 285, we'll just put that there. 285. Sleep. You have been asleep for about an hour when the noise of deep growl growling wakes you up. You stand up without making a noise and grab your sword. You wait and listen. There is a full moon in the sky and the light casts eerie shadows all around. You hear soft footsteps and sniffing followed by another low growl. Then the shape which looks like a man steps out of the shadows to your right. As he gets closer you see that his chest, arms and face are covered with thick brown hair and long teeth protrude from his mouth. He is a werewolf, and you must fight him. So here we are, that's the werewolf there. Looks more man-like than wolf-like, which is a bit unusual for a werewolf uh, look, actually. So, yeah. If you defeat him, turn to 388. Okay, so we've got um, a werewolf, 8 and 9. So he's quite a strong 8, 9. So, eight, nine. and I've got 9.21, so he's only a little bit less skilled than I am. This could be quite an even fight. He rolls 7, I roll 3. He rolls an 8, I roll 7, that's a draw. He rolls a 10, I roll a 9, and that is a... Oh, hang on. Yes, that is a draw. He rolls a 7, I roll 3. Down to 17. He rolls a 7. I roll an 8. So he is injured for 2 points. He rolls an 8. I roll a 7. Draw again. He rolls a 7. I roll an 8. So he is injured for 2 more hit points. He rolls a 12. And I roll a 12. Oh. 3. He rolls 2. And I roll 12 again. Oh my. Uh, he rolls 8, and I roll 8, so that means he is dead after some very interesting dice rolls there. So, I defeat him, and I go to 388. 
eight. No silver needed in this case. If the werewolf wounded you during combat, turn to 155. It did indeed. If it did not receive any wounds, add one luck point and turn to 316. Interesting, interesting. So, um, so, we've got like that. Um, 155 wounded with 316 unscathed plus one luck. So it's very nice that they tell you this after the battle because sometimes these kinds of special rules for what happens when you get injured or a certain number of times are actually in the paragraph itself where you're fighting and you might be more tempted to cheat. Um, tea is getting a bit cold, but it's still nice. So I was wounded, and I'm going to 155. You settle down to sleep again, but start to shake and tremble. Sweat pours from your body, although you feel very cold. Do you possess any belladonna? If you do, turn to 83, otherwise turn to 259. So... I, let's see, Belladonna. I'm presuming that's something you could have picked up on the way now, but I do not have any. So we have 83, yes, or 100 and, no, 259. 259, no. So I don't have any Belladonna. That's 259 for me. You feel a burning sensation inside your body as you sink into a raging fever. You may be about to change into a werewolf yourself. Lose three stamina points. And test your luck, if you're still alive. So I've got a luck now of eight. And I roll an eight, so that is lucky. If the number rolled is equal to or less than your luck score, the fever dies down, turn to 244. If the number rolled is greater than your luck score, the fever continues to grip your body and you are horrified to see thick brown hair appearing on the back of your hands. Shock causes you to lose two additional stamina points if you are still alive, turn to 19, etc. But I didn't make my luck test. So test luck, and uh, also there's um, stamina minus three. Um, so uh, let's see, let's do the 19, fail, luck score, and uh, unlucky, you unlucky I should call it, unlucky, that's my usual way of denominating it, so and then there's 244, lucky, right. So I'm going to 244. The effects of the fever finally wear off and you gratefully fall asleep again. In the morning you collect your belongings and head north along the path to the hills. Turn to 198. So I'll just do 198 over here. Uh, The ground is quite steep as the path wends its way into the hills. By the time you reach the top, the sun is quite hot. All around in the distance you see the dark green circle of dark wood forest. Mist still hangs in the tall grasses behind you, but ahead you see a valley floor bathed in sunlight. All is quiet. As you start down the far side of the hill, you see a junction in the path. You may either continue north, down the hill, or head east along the new branch. So that is... Uh, 278 north, 87 east. So I'm going to just continue my current path and go north, 278. Uh, the path runs through a narrow gorge between two hills. You feel vulnerable and draw your sword, expecting to be ambushed at any moment. 
Unfortunately, because you are concentrating on washing the sides of the gorge, you do not see a small patch of leaves and branches on the path ahead. Hmm. Um, your foot goes right through the thin covering of a bear trap, and you plunge four meters to the bottom of a rocky pit. To add to your misfortune, a wooden stake with a sharp tip points out of the center of the pit. Test your luck. If you're lucky to manage to avoid landing on the wooden stake, let's see, so we got a luck of seven. Roll an eight, so that means I'm unlucky. So we've got... Uh, uh, let's see, if you're lucky, you manage to avoid landing on the wooden stake, but fall heavily on the floor, lose two stamina points and turn to 319. Or, let's see, so 319, 319, uh, lucky. Okay. Stamina minus two, or unlucky. Um, if you're still alive, if you're, if you're unlucky, the point of the stake pierces your leg as you land. Lose two stamina points for the fall and a further two stamina points for the injury to your leg. So that's down to 14 points. So um, if you're still alive, turn to 319. Okay, so that's 319 again. So, um, so minus two slash minus four stamina. Let's remove that from there. And we're going to 319. Do you possess boots of leaping? Do I possess boots of leaping? Yes, I do. If you do, turn to 228. So we've got um, boots of leaping. I wasn't intending to write that in red, but now it's more obvious on the maps. So that's OK. Um, so 218, yes, or 14, no. So maybe if you don't have that, it's going to be very hard to get out of this bear pit. Um, 228, yes, I'm going to 228 so I can leap a little bit. The pit is circular with smooth sides and you are weak from your fall. You reach into your backpack and pull out the brown leather boots. They are very light on your feet. You crouch down and in one mighty leap you are out of the pit. You dust yourself off and continue your walk north down the gorge. Turn to 255. That was relatively easy. So 255. 255 north. Continuing. Um, continuing down the gorge, you see the handle of a sword sticking out from a large rock by the side of the path. If you should try to pull the sword free from the rock, turn to 182. If you wish to continue, go to 334. So we have... Um, sword 182, sword, I'm going to try to pull it, pull it out, obviously. Right. You take hold of the sword and place your foot against the rock. Roll two dice. If the number rolled is equal to or less than your current skill score, the sword slowly slides out of the rock. And uh, turn to 70. So, 70. So, test skill and success is 70. Um, if the number rolled is greater than your current skill score, the sword will not move. Your tyrant are forced to give up and continue do north down the gorge, 2334. So there we are. Um, I'm rolling against skill, which is nine, uh, nine or less, and that is less, so that is success, and I get the sword, which may or may not be a good thing. The sword is magnificent and was obviously made by a master craftsman. It feels powerful in your hand. Add two points to your current skill score for your enchanted sword. Um, and of course, this is where the rules uh, really fall short, because now it's telling me I have an enchanted sword, but it also tells me in the rules I can't increase my skill over my initial skill, which means technically you can't add two points to your skill for an enchanted sword, because that is not within the rules. Um, I'm not sure if they actually intended for this to be the case, but really what it should do, if you have an enchanted sword, it should tell you get two extra attack score every time you use it, things like that. 
Anyway. So, and then you go to 3.34. It looks like it's time to change the page of my map now. Between the hills, you see the flat green valley floor stretching out ahead and beyond a sinister wall of trees, dark with forest. Oh, surprise. On the other side of the trees lies Stonebridge, your journey's end. Arriving on the valley floor, the path ends at a junction. If you want to head west, turn to 113. If you want to head east, turn to 51. Okay, so now I am... Um, so I am at 334 down here-ish. 34, from 258, or from 182, or from 17. Um, and I can head west or east. So west, one, one, three, west or um, 51 east, 51 east. Okay, um, right, that's right at the edge of screen again okay let's make sure that's in short um so just to follow the path that i've been or the system i've done so far i'm just trying to do the western route now so it seems uh that just became a thing uh so i'm going to head west and go to 113. the path makes a sudden turn to the right and heads north across the valley floor so it goes like this i'm just doing that just to show that um, to the left of the path, you see a large pond with a small wooden hut with a thatched roof by its edge. If you want to investigate the hut, turn to 324. If you wish to ignore the hut and continue north along the path, turn to 149. So we've got 149 going north and investigation is over here. And that is 149 and I'll probably need more room for that. But, oh, no, hang on. 324, sorry. 324. Uh, obviously, I'm going to investigate. So 324. And let's see what happens. Uh, you walk around to the front of the hut and see... Uh, sorry, I bumped into the camera there. Um, hmm. That's the last of my tea. I'll have to swap to water. Because I can't do that thing with a water bottle, putting it under the camera, because there's no room. Um... Um, sorry, getting confused now. You walk around to the front of the hut and see a large blue vase standing on a small porch. There is nobody about. You open the door of the hut, but there is nobody inside. The hut is also devoid of any furniture or objects. You walk outside again and inspect the blue vase. You look inside, but despite the sunlight, are unable to see beyond the rim. The vase is filled with an eerie blackness. You shake it and hear a rattling sound. You may drop the vase on the ground, put your hand inside the vase, ignore the vase and return to the path and head north. So these are uh, more or less sensible sounding options. Um, so we've got, I'll just cramp them together like this now. So 250, drop, 161, hand. Obviously, being a sensible person, you would drop the vase on the ground and not put your hand in. But I'm going to be a little bit foolhardy. And I'm going to put my hand in the vase and see what happens. And also, I'm not sure if I've actually been here before when I've played this game. I can't remember this bit at all now. As your hand descends into the inky blackness of the vase, it is gripped by an intense pain. First, it feels as if it is being crushed, and then it feels as if it is on fire. If you wish to pull your hand out of the vase, turn to 185. Uh, if you want to feel around to find out what is inside the vase, turn to 341. So we've got two options. I'll just put them up here. Um, so that's... Boom, boom. Um, so 185, pull, 
or 341 continue okay i've already said a i'll say b uh as we say in norway so i'm gonna keep going and i'm gonna see what's inside the vase and go to 341 even if it kill me the pain in your hand becomes almost unbearable but you still <coughs> retain feeling in it at the bottom of the vase your hand comes into contact with several objects you grasp them grasp them and pull your hand quickly out of the vase you're surprised to see no mark or sign of injury on your hand. You examine your treasure and find five gold pieces, a dragon's tooth, and a glass file containing a potion of strength, which will restore five stamina points whenever you decide to drink it. Hmm. So a potion of stamina. So that's a five, five stamina potion. Uh, add one luck point. Okay, I'll just do that again. So I'm up to seven. Uh, five gold pieces, so five GP, I'll just put GP, uh, a dragon's tooth. I wonder if it's a golden one, if I can uh, return to Firetop Mountain. Right, so, and luck plus one. So we have um, five GP, um, Potion, dragon's tooth. Okay then. Excuse me. So basically, the the um, what you felt when you put the hand in the vase was an illusion um, spell that was put on the vase to protect the contents. Hmm. See, sometimes foolhardiness or bravery, I suppose, favours the, uh, well, foolhardy. Um, or the bold. 149. Let's see. I'm a bit of fortune. As, yes, 149. So that's going back to this one. Okay. Um, as you walk across the valley, you see the dark green wall of darkwood forest looming up before you. The path leads directly into thick undergrowth and soon... You are walking between um, tall dark trees and thorny bushes. It is dark and quiet. The path forks. If you wish to walk east, turn to 130. If you would rather continue north, turn to 306. So let's just do a little bit up ahead here now, just to give us a bit of room. Um, so 306 north or... Um, Go off here, uh, 130 east. Just have a little bit of space for whatever is going on down there. Um, I'm going to go north, go to 306. Um, amidst the trees to the left of the path, you see a small stone building covered with ivy and moss. You have to examine the building, turn to 391. I don't mind if I do. Um, examine. Um, if you wish to carry on north along the path, turn to 112. I'll just do like that, 112 north. So I'm going to examine the building, obviously, because this is what I'm doing now. I'm on an exploratory mission rather than expecting to win this one. The building measures only 3 meters by 3 meters and has no windows. Maybe it's running on Mac OS instead. The door is made of stone and looks very solid. Oh, I missed us. There, there is no handle and there does not appear that there is another way to enter the building. Then you notice a tiny keyhole in the stone door. Do you possess a silver key? Okay, so I don't have a silver key. So in this case, I need a silver key, question mark. And... Uh, yes, and that is 200. No, 379. No silver key, I'm going to 379. You may either try to charge the door down or return to the path and head north. So I'm going to tell charge. It is made of stone. Charging does seem like a silly thing to do. Let's try it. So, 
You step back and then charge at the door. Roll two dice. If the number rolled is equal to or less than both your luck and skill scores. Okay, so that is a skill slash luck test. Um, the door flies open. If the number rolled is greater than either your luck or skill score, you bounce off the door and rub your bruised shoulder without getting any damage. Well, that's a bit strange because normally in these circumstances you would take like two stamina damage, or one at least. You decide against risking any further in due to yourself and return to the path. So we've got um, 327, uh, let's see, it's a 320, 327. Success. Okay, so uh, roll two dice, and it has to be below nine and below seven, both. So it needs to be below seven, basically, uh, or seven and below, and it's six. Okay, and this was not a test your luck. This is just rolling against luck and skill. So I don't reduce luck for this one. Um, whenever you are meant to reduce luck, it says test your luck, and it says in italics. It's it's very specific. Um, Thing, um, and important that to take note of. So, 327. Inside you see stone stone. Actually, I didn't make a note of my uh, magic sword here. I've got a sword plus two. Um, inside you see stone stairs leading down from the door into gloomy depths. You cannot see a thing down the stairs. If you wish to descend the stairs, turn to 351. If you wish to leave the building. And 212. Uh, obviously, I'm going to descend the stairs. Stairs. This being an Ian Livingstone book, I'm thinking this is where his standard vampire lives because there seems to be a vampire in every single one of his books so far. Uh, at least all the ones. Oh, not in um, Freeway Fight, I didn't have a vampire. Well, that's the exception that proves the rule, I think, in this case. Um, you step carefully down the stone stairs, feeling your way as you go. Slowly your eyes become accustomed to the dark and you begin to make out shapes at the bottom of the stairs. You're standing in a small square room with a low ceiling. The floor is thick with dust and there are cobwebs everywhere. In the middle of the room there is what appears to be a large stone box measuring approximately two meters by one meter. I think it's called a sarcophagus if it's in a room like this. You don't call it the stone box. Uh, on top of it is a great stone slab. Along one of the rough stone walls, you find a small alcove with a candle in it. You may either light the candle or back, walk back up the stairs. Okay, that's a strange combination of options. So, Either I light the candle, 292, or I walk back up. So no examining the box, no anything else, lighting candle, or going back. So what is an adventurer to do? Lighting the candle, obviously. So nothing else for it. Um, the light from the candle casts eerie shadows around the room. In the yellow light, you see the face of an old man carved into the stone slab top of the box. Then he noticed the leg of a skeleton protruding from the shadows in the far corner of the room. You walk over to the skeleton to inspect it. The skeleton is small and the skull has sharp protruding teeth. It could be the skeleton of either a goblin or an orc. You walk over to the stone box. The slab on top looks as if it could be moved. You wish to try to lift the stone slab. Again, that's not the right thing to do. You're supposed to push it. You're not supposed to lift it. Um, to slide it, as it were. Uh, right, if you wish to ignore the slab and return, then it's 112. You're given lots of options to go back here. So obviously, um, if you die now, you, you can sort of say, yeah, well, you're given so many chances of going back now. So I'm going to go to 95 and lifting, apparently, the slab instead of sliding it. Um, let's see, 95. You try with all your might to move the stone slab, but it will not budge. Do you have any dust of levitation? I do, because I won that fair and square in um, arm wrestling, would you believe? Even with my low skill. So, 
Um, dust levitation question mark. And so it's uh, yes, one seventy three or no. 368, 368. No. So I've got that. I'm going to 173. You take from your backpack the glass file containing the sparkling dust and sprinkle it on the stone slab. Slowly the stone slab starts to rise into the air. You peer into the box and are horrified to see a rotting corpse lying there. Ragged clothes cover a skeletal body with loose flesh hanging from it. You have lifted the lid off a coffin containing some cursed, cursed undead creature and jump back in horror as you see its eyes flick open. That's a bit of a strange order of describing it. Um, what it should have said is as its eyes flick open, you realize you have lifted the lid off a coffin containing some cursed undead creature. Um... You are in a crypt made foul by some unknown follower of darkness. Slowly the creature rises out of its coffin and moves towards you with outstretched arms. Do you possess any holy water? That's one of the things I got stolen from me. Uh, if you do, turn to 58. If not, turn to 227. So we have holy water. New. No. Um, and that's 58, yes, or um, 227, no. Okay, so we've got no holy water. Let's see what happens next. The creature about to attack you with its claws is a ghoul. So another Ian Livingston favorite, I suppose. Um, excuse me. Um, and it's skill 9 of stamina 7, so 9, 7, and I'm currently on 9, 14. It has the ability to paralyze you if it scores 4 separate wounds on you during this battle. If you defeat the ghoul, turn to 312. If it kills you or paralyzes you, turn to 2. So we have... Um, Probably messed up our map completely now, but I'm going to do like this now. Um, so I'll go with 312, win, and to lose. Let's call it lose. Right, so we both have a skill of nine. Let's roll. So he's got a seven, and I roll a seven. That's a draw. He rolls a four. I roll an 8, it's down to 5 hit points, he rolls a 9, I roll a 6, I'm down to 12 hit points, he rolls a 4, I roll 3, I'm down to 10 hit points, he rolls a 7, I roll a 9, he's down to 3 hit points, he rolls a 4, I roll an 11, so he's down to 1 hit point, he rolls a five, I roll a four, I'm down to eight hit points, that's three hits he's done on me now, isn't it? Uh, yes. He rolls a nine, I roll a four, and that is four wounds he has inflicted on me. Which means he paralyzes me, which means I go to paragraph two. And it says, Your adventure ends here as your tasty fresh flesh is about to become a savory feast for the victorious ghoul. Not as nice as the description in uh, the Warlock of Firetop Mountain where the ghoul is dancing basically on top of your dead body so that is the end of uh, this um little first run into the forest of doom um i didn't see any parts of the hammer i certainly learned a little bit about the western path um 
doesn't seem like there are any things here that I'll presumably need to uh, win the game. I noticed here that this is where I need the holy water. Presumably most of these items you only need them one time. So what I've learned is I don't need to bring the holy water if I avoid this place. Uh, although it may yet have some treasures in there that could be useful, but I don't know that. Um, boots of leaping, what they're called, yes. I may not need those anywhere else either, so that's useful to know. Um, so I can sort of, if I avoid these places or those traps and that crypt, I may be able to avoid bringing those, which means I'm more likely to bring the other things that I will need for the more correct paths next time. This is how I have to sort of learn what is useful to bring. Um, of course, the Dust of Levitation, a very specific item. Um, I'm sort of thinking that, uh, and also Armband of Strength is will make it easier to win it. Maybe that's also another thing that I don't need to get. I'm thinking probably not. Um, at least that is saying that, uh, because for the moment, I don't know for sure whether you can only use these things once. Uh, I mean, what to say is that there's only one place to use them. There may be more than one for some of them, I don't know, but I'm sort of having this theory that there's only one place in the book where you will need to use each of these items you can buy from Yaz Tromo. So, um, yeah. That was quite an interesting uh, little run, I think, um, and into the Forest of Doom, um, meeting this charming creature as well, which was good because uh, it's a very vivid and uh, picture that could give people nightmares, I think. Um, and also, I did notice, uh, it looks like my book is actually quite good condition as well. It's a little bit of the speckled brown on the edge there, but otherwise it's in very good nick. Um, Yes, Forest of Doom, first playthrough. Uh, I will have to try again um, later today or tomorrow. So, thanks for watching uh, if you watched all the way through. And, uh, well, obviously, if you haven't watched all the way through, you probably wouldn't get to this bit, so you wouldn't know that I said that, uh, unless you just skip to the end. And why would you? Because in this kind of video, the whole point is the journey, not the end point. There are no conclusions here. Um, thanks for watching and uh, I will see you next time and uh, yeah yeah I think that's it um, goodbye for now bye bye